In this session, I want to address the theme of Christ uh, in the uh, in the covenants. And in many ways, this is the revelation in my own head that opened up the scriptures uh, for me. Uh, I can't recall exactly when the significance of this dawned on me, uh, but it really is the first thing that opened up the Old Testament uh, for me in terms of its redemptive message, in terms of what it reveals to us, particularly about Christ. And as we come to look at the covenants and the installations of the covenants, and I'll put that within the framework here in a moment of the covenant of grace, only one covenant with various manifestations and installments of that covenant through redemptive history. But the New Testament certainly gives us warrant for finding Christ in the Old Testament. You'll recall that uh, when Gabriel uh, announced to Mary that she would be having the Messiah, that he linked that to the promise that was given to David. And then John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, when he finally opened his mouth after the birth of John the Baptist, linked his son as the forerunner of the one that was going to come, who was the fulfillment of the promise that was given both to Abraham and to David linking it to those covenant promises. And then the book of Hebrews, of course, speaks of Christ who is the better covenant. So we have every warrant for finding Christ and learning of Christ in the Old Testament covenant revelations. Let me begin simply by defining what we mean by a covenant. I know that in our particular environment, our circle, it's a word that's thrown around a lot, right? We are covenant, uh, and we have our covenant baptism, and we have our covenant theology, and we have our covenant this, covenant that. Uh, and it's a word that just so easily uh, flows from our lips. Uh, so what exactly do we mean by a covenant? It's one of the most important concepts that we have, certainly in the Old Testament. A covenant basically, in, in very simplistic terms, is a mutually binding agreement. It's a mutually binding agreement that formalizes really two different categories here that I'll define for you. On the one hand, you have those mutually binding agreements that formalize a non-natural relationship where parties that would not normally be party together will come together and the covenant will formalize that particular relationship. Or it may also be used uh, for the restoring or forming a relationship that would be on a natural basis where you would have equal parties, uh, as it were. Now, you have two different kinds of covenants that are revealed to us and are, are illustrated for us uh, in the Old Testament scriptures. First of all, what's called a parity covenant. A parity covenant is that which would exist between equals. Uh, you recall, for instance, when, I guess it was, was it Isaac who got into a controversy with uh, the Philistines over wells and they kept, they well, kept changing, changing. They finally came to an agreement among themselves. They came to a covenant uh, where they mutually bound themselves uh, as equal parties, you take that one, I'll take this one. That, that's, a, that's a parity covenant. Uh, the covenant that existed between David and Jonathan. They were friends and they were loyal one to the other, but they were, as it were, on equal foundation. So the parity covenant is one type of covenant, and the other we sometimes refer to as a sincerity covenant. This is a suzerain, just a king. A suzerainty covenant is one that is between a superior and an inferior. And that certainly, when we come to look at the covenant that exists between God and men, uh, it is 
obviously a sincerity of covenant. God is the superior, and those with whom he enters into that covenant relationship are the inferiors. Uh, and the, 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 the beauty here, or the essence really, of a sincerity covenant uh, is that the suzerain, the king, sets the terms. There's no negotiations. Uh, there's no bargaining. There's no compromise. One or the other, the king sets the terms. And that fits very wonderfully then with the relationship that exists between God and men. That God reveals himself to us really in terms of a covenant. Uh, it's a non-natural relationship. How infinite, how superior is God and how inferior are we is man. But in this non-natural relationship, God takes the initiative and he enters in then to this binding agreement. He sets the terms. He sets the terms, the stipulations, but also makes various promises and guarantees on the basis of that covenant that he enters into. So this is the, this is the idea. Now, when we talk about the covenants then, these installments, we're talking then about a cesarity type covenant where God is the superior, Man is the inferior. God sets the terms. No bargaining, no compromise. It's an act of grace uh, by which God reveals himself and enters into relationships uh, with people. Now, the broad spectrum, certainly in covenant theology, uh, we talk on the one hand about the covenant of works. We talk about the covenant of grace. Covenant of works is that which was instituted first in the garden with Adam. He disobeyed, he broke the terms of that covenant and consequently faced the consequences. Not only for Adam, but for all of his posterity. I'm not going to get into all the federal headship of Adam, but you, you know that connection, right? Because Adam sinned, there's death in Adam and all those that come into this world by natural generation are dead in Adam, they're dead in sin. Uh, a consequence of that broken covenant of works. But as soon as the covenant of works was broken, God now enters into and reveals this covenant of grace. Genesis 3.15. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now let me just you know, make this clear as well. When we talk about the covenant of works and covenant of grace. There's works, there's grace. I don't want to keep harping on my dispensational friends, but I want to make sure we understand the difference between how we view the covenant of works and covenant of grace and how the dispensationalists do. Dispensationalists would say, yeah, there, there's a covenant of works, but that stopped when we have the covenant of grace, right? Uh, and that's no longer operative. Whereas we understand that there is death in Adam and there is life in Christ. And the only experience of the only experience of grace is going to be as we are in Christ. To be in Adam is to still be under the obligations of the demands of the covenant of works. You do it perfectly or else. You obey perfectly or else. And the or else is going to apply to all of those just like it did uh, to Adam. So they are now concurrent. So here's works. Now there's works. And, and there's grace. Right? And now they are concurrent. You're either in Adam or in Christ. Uh, and that, that's the idea. But you, you understand that. That's just basic covenant theology. So in this one covenant of grace, there are various installments of this covenant. And that's what I want to walk through with you this evening. Okay? Mm -hmm. The different installments of this covenant of grace. And how this covenant of grace that in these various installments reveal to us more and more about Jesus. And Jesus is going to be at the very heart, he's going to be at the very essence of everyone of these covenant installments. The revelation progresses. 
Let me just define some more terms here for a moment before we get into the specifics. We talk about progressive revelation. And by this we simply mean that God did not real, God didn't just throw down the Bible to us all in one package. Right? Uh, but truth was revealed progressively. Progressively. And in this progressive revelation, it was always, it was never, let me put it this way first, progressive revelation was never from wrong to right. It wasn't that the next revelation corrected what was before. So it's not from wrong to right. It wasn't even from incomplete to complete. Because incomplete truth is not true. Progressive revelation, we must understand, as being from general to specific. That's the, that, that's the progression, going from a general to a specific. And as the revelation then progresses, as the revelation progresses, more and more details, more and more details are given. I, I use this illustration. If you, if you look at the giving of Moses, I think I have this in, in the book as well, explaining progressive revelation. But when I got two boys, and when my younger son was just a toddler, he went with his mother to the grocery store. And he came home and says, Dad, let me show you what I have. What do you have? And he had this plastic egg. He had this plastic egg. And I said, where did you get that? What is that egg? He said, where did you get that? He says, from that machine, you know, the grocery stores, I haven't been to one in a long time, but they used to have... Uh, these machines by the grocery store that seduce children, right, to put in a quarter and they get some kind of a prize. Well, he, he spent a quarter uh, and he got this egg. And I said, Char my name's Charlie, so I said, Charlie, I, I taught three classes for that quarter. <laughs> uh, and, and now you're, you're, wasting, you're wasting my money. You're wasting my be, be frugal here. Don't be wasting money. But he says, Dad, where do you see what this does? What does it do? What does it do? Inside this egg was a little fish. And he says, if you put this fish in water, it will grow. Okay. Okay. So we got we, we, we got this baking dish or whatever it was, I don't know. We put some water in it and put that little fish in there. And I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. The next day, the next day, we looked at that. And that fish got bigger. And I could see on that fish an eye, a little mouth, and what I presume were scales. And I said, would you look at that? Would you look at that? And it dawned me that is a classic example of progressive revolution. A quarter well spent. After <laughs> what happened? Now, was that eye there the day before? Yeah. Was that mouth there the day before? Yeah. Was all, yeah, but all, that, all that was there. But I couldn't see it. But I couldn't see it. But as it expanded, as it expanded, I could now see more of the details that were already, that were already there included in that little bit. To this day, yeah, to this day, I regret we didn't put the bath up. <laughs> we may have found Joan in there, I don't know. Uh, but the whole point, right, the whole point it is as it expanded, I saw more and more details, more and more details of what was there. And this is progressive revelation. As a revelation is given, and then more and more details are given. More and more details are given. So that when we come to the end of it, as we're going to see, as we come to David ultimately uh, in the Davidic covenant, then I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that when the New Testament says, uh, here's the promise to David, here, here comes Jesus, here comes Jesus. So in every, in every one of these covenant solution, installations, installments, that's my word, installments, here comes Jesus. More and more detail. 
more and more detail about who Jesus is. So in the first promise, it's all there. It's all there. But I don't see the details yet. But the fact that I don't see the details does not alter the fact, does not alter the information that is there in that particular covenant. And so the covenant institution, installations, installments, why can't I get that word? Installments uh, are just a beautiful way whereby God is revealing more and more about the coming curse reverses. Now, I want to walk you through these. If you got the Bible, you can take a look at these with me. Uh, the first one is in Genesis. I, I've mentioned this already as being really a pivotal text as far as finding Christ and looking for Christ uh, in the Old Testament. But you know the context here in Genesis chapter 3. Man has fallen, disobeyed God in that covenant of works, and now the curse is, is given. And the Lord now states the curse. And it's not without significance to me, it's a beautiful thing, that in the very revelation of the curse, statement of the curse, we have the blessing of the gospel. As soon as man needed a gospel, as soon as man needed a word of grace, here comes the word of grace. How great is God. Oh, oh, let me read this. If you have your Bibles, I'm looking at uh, Genesis 3, 14, 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. And of every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thou shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Here it is. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now I grant you that the term covenant, the word Hebrew word, yeah. Brief. Could you say brief? I wish my Hebrew students were that way. <laughs> brief. Covenant. The term covenant does not occur in this text. Doesn't occur in relationship to the uh, covenant of works. But although the term covenant doesn't occur, the elements of a covenant, I'm not taking the time this evening to uh, go through what all of the constituent parts of a covenant are. They are there, even though the term itself uh, is, is not used. But I can delve, well, well say, because Hebrews, uh, not Hebrews, uh, Hosea, Hosea chapter 12 uh, speaks of the covenant that was broken, the covenant that Adam broke, all right? Uh, I think the King James translated that man broke, but the, the word man there is Adam. It's Adam. The Adam broke. So Hosea, under inspiration, tells me that there was indeed a bereave, there was a covenant uh, in that particular context. So even though the term doesn't occur, it nonetheless is a covenant. And what is interesting to me here is that the very statement of grace, the very statement of the reversing of the curse, is given. To the servant. It's given to the servant. Uh, and a word from the very get go that God was going to deal with the servant and there was going to be a reversing of the curse. Now look at the elements here. I will put enmity. I will put enmity between the two seeds. First of all, let us notice that it's God's idea. This whole covenant is God's idea. It's non-negotiable. All right? Here's this suzerainty. It's non-negotiable. This is God's declaration. Uh, it's God's idea. And you can see, I will. I will put the enmity between thee and the woman. It's the work of God. It's God's initiative. Grace is God's initiative. Grace is not something that man has any claim to. Uh, man cannot obligate God to be gracious. God is gracious to whom he will be gracious. And here is this divine initiative. I will do it. 
Okay, so you can't miss, you can't miss that. And then you have God's plan. What's God's plan here? What's the plan? A change in the relationship. A change in the relationship between the woman and the serpent. In what, what happened in the fall? In the fall, Eve sided with the serpent. She took the serpent's side against God's side. But the Lord says, we're going to take care of it. So I'm going to put him to do. We're going to reverse this relationship. He's changing the relationship between the woman and the serpent. We're going to put him to do uh, Between the woman and the serpent. Now that goes far beyond just a female aversion to snakes, right? Uh, because I guarantee you, there's male aversion to snakes too. Uh, that's, that's not the point. That's not the point. Uh, it's not a fear of snakes that's involved here, but there's going to be a change in relationship. She has deciding with God against the serpent. And here's here's grace. Here's grace. I'll put enmity. And between thy seed and her seed. Seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, there are certain clue words. As you're doing your search for Christ in the Old Testament, there are certain buzzwords, there are certain clue words that ought to awaken you to the reality that this is going to be talking about Christ. And seed is one of them, the seed of the offspring. That's a buzzword, that's a key word. Uh, that is going to bring you into a, a, a very often a messianic context. So the seed of the serpent, those that are going to, not in this instance, the physical seed, obviously, but those that are the, that are representing the seed of the serpent. This, remember what, what Jesus said to the Pharisees, for instance. Uh, it, when, when the Pharisees were like, hey, we're, 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 we're Abraham's seed. Christ didn't deny that. Christ did not deny that they were Abraham's seed in terms of their physical lineage is concerned, but then he turns around and says, What? You're of your father, the devil. Or you're of your father, the devil. So that's a representation. So who are the seed of the serpent? All those that are outside of Christ. All those that are antagonistic and hostile to the gospel. And the seed then of the woman. And the seed of the woman ultimately. Put a capital S on that. Is a reference to the curse reversal. Who is going to be the one who reverses the curse? This one, this one that is the seed of the woman that will be in contest then with the expansion of this hostility, the expansion of this enmity. Now, not just between Eve and the serpent, but now between the seed. Here's the expansion of this hostility. And that seed Singular, it can be complicated at times, sometimes singular, sometimes collective. We'll talk about this more when we come to Abraham. Uh, but I'm interpreting this, and I think most do, uh, as a reference to the curse reversal, which is going to be Jesus. And then the outcome of this. He's going to bruise the serpent. The serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman will bruise by head. Here's the outcome. Here's the outcome of this hostility. Bruising the head is fatal. Bruising the heel is not fatal. Okay? But in addition to that, and I'm not going to be dogmatic on this, but it's my, it's my view, how I interpret it. The word that is translated in our King James Version here is bruise. Crush, bruise. That's a homonym. You know what a homonym is? Homonyms are words that sound the same in English, but they're spelled differently. Uh, there. There, there, uh, different words, right, but all sound the same. In Hebrew, because of the nature of the phonemic 
uh, values of, of the letters. The homonym will not always be spelled the same, or a sound name will be spelled the same. There's a homonym of this word I'm saying that has the idea of snapping at, of snapping at. I know, I'm inclined to see it that way. Can I translate it that way then? That it, that is the seed of the woman, will crush, will bruise the head of the serpent. <clears throat> and you, the serpent, will nip at his heels. You'll nip at his heels. You'll snap at his heels. It's not fatal, but it's an annoying. It's an annoyance, right? And, and how many times? How many times did Satan do what he could do to thwart the whole redemptive purpose? How many times did part of his seed, was his seed used uh, to destroy the seed of the woman? It's nipping, 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 nipping. But never any success. Never any success because of God's protection. But either way, I'm not going to be dogmatic on it, but I think it gives a picture there of of the uh, technique of Satan, as it were, to just keep nipping at Christ's heels, doing everything he could do to somehow thwart uh, the ministry of the first reverser. But what is the key lesson here? And this is crucial. I talked in the last session about the importance of the historical and economic context. This is crucial. The very first promise, the very first promise of the coming curse reverser is that it's going to be a man. It's going to be the seed of a woman. Curse reverser, the very first promise into humanity. Not into the herd, not a sheep, not a bull, not a bullock, but a man. The very first promise of the gospel is that the curse reverser is going to come into humanity. And that there's going to be hostility. There's going to be hostility between those two seeds. And the whole course, you mean the whole course of Old Testament history. Do we not see that hostility? There's Pharaoh. There's Pharaoh as seed of the serpent. Doing everything that he could do to for Kill all those Hebrew babies. All the males. Kill them. Kill them. But God intervened. God intervened. Had Pharaoh succeeded, had Pharaoh succeeded in killing all, then, you know, there goes, there goes the promise. Certainly in jeopardy. We come, as I said, David and Goliath. And, and you see the nations that have come against Israel trying to, and then you come to the New Testament. There's Herod. There's hair in the New Testament, kill, kill those babies, trying to kill Christ. And, and, and you, you have you, you have Satan himself in the temptation doing what he can do to get rid of Christ. Constant hostility. So in this whole plan of redemption, in this whole plan of redemption, God has factored in the hostility between the seasons. So why would you be surprised? Why should we be surprised when we see the enmity that is against the church today? We consider this some yesterday when I when I preached that you know here here's if, if all this wickedness is happening and the church is viewed as the enemy to the state the church is viewed as the, the, the enemies of society the world hates the church the world Christ says don't be surprised I hate me going to hate you. So why should we be surprised when we see the persecution? Why should we be surprised when we see it? Because God, even in the very first promise of redemption, has factored in this hostility. But who's going to win? Who's going to win? The curse reverse. So Genesis 3.15, I cannot emphasize enough. I can't emphasize enough how absolutely vital this covenant promise is. Here's the first installment of the covenant of grace. As far as man is concerned, uh, Redeemer is going to come into humanity. So let's keep that in mind. First reverser is coming into humanity. All right, what's the next? What's the next installment? Man does everything he can do, seemingly. 
to frustrate God's purpose. It's not long in the history of mankind that we see the proliferation of sin. Adam's own kids. Sin. Lamb, sin. And then you have the sin of, of, of the world that I, I speak anthropopathically here in relation to God that brought God to the limit of his patience and destroy humanity. Going to destroy the world. Here comes the flood. Man's sin earned that catastrophic judgment. Here comes the flood. And destroys all of humanity. It appeared, at least it appeared on the surface that that jeopardized the promise. If, if you're destroying the whole world and all of humanity, what about the promise of Genesis 3.15? What about that promise? Well, here's Noah and his kids. Yeah, Noah's spirit. Noah's kids. Jim, Ham, Jacob. They're spared. But Noah looks around and says, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the perfect person. And I know these kids, and they're not the perfect person. What about the promise? It appeared that the promise that a Redeemer was going to come into humanity was now jeopardized. But here comes grace. Here comes grace. And God enters into a covenant with Noah. Here's the next installment of the covenant of grace. And now the term grief does occur. This is the first context in which the term <coughs> grief occurs in the Old Testament. God enters into a covenant with Noah. And part of the covenant with Noah is going to go back to the covenant in Genesis 3.15. Because God says what in this covenant? I will not again destroy humanity with the flood. So in the Noachian covenant, you have on one hand, God vouched Satan, Genesis 3.15. Humanity is going to be spared. Humanity is going to continue. The framework, the groundwork, the foundation in which the first reverse is going to come is going to be preserved. So one thing in the Noachian covenant is the preser preservation of humanity and therefore the preservation of Genesis 3.15. Mankind continues. And so the seed of the woman is still coming. And there's the rainbow. That covenant sign that bears witness and testifies to the faithfulness of God. And every time to this day, I hope, and it, this agrees with me that the rainbow has been hijacked uh, in our society, but that bow that speaks to us of God's covenant faithfulness. Every time you see a rainbow, even to this day, you ought to think here is God's promise of Jesus. The covenant promise that humanity was going to continue. But as I said earlier, in every covenant institution, there is going to be a new revelation. There's going to be an advancing, a new detail is going to be given to us. So let's consider what this new detail is. On the one hand, the key essence of the component, I say, is preserving humanity. But what happened right after that, after they came out? It became very clear right quickly, didn't it? That the flood did not solve the sin problem. Didn't solve the sin problem. And you know the story there of the, the drunkenness of Noah and how things, yeah. Bad situation. And that sin that Ham committed. But just as in Genesis 3, the sin became an opportunity for a manifestation of grace. So the sin of Noah's family was the opportunity for a new manifestation of grace. Let me have you look at Genesis chapter 9 here. 
So after the sin of Ham is revealed, we have another pronouncement of a curse. And in the statement of the curse, another blessing. Verse 25 of chapter 9. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Canaan was the son of Ham. You have here basically a illustration of the lex talionis, the law of retaliation. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, it was Ham that sinned against his father, and now here's the judgment coming upon Ham's son, Cain. We'll talk about that later. He said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So there's the curse. Canaan is going to be reduced to service. And we see that demonstrated when we come to the book of Joshua, right? See that demonstrated as the Canaanites are some killed, others are taken into bondage and made into servitude. Yeah. But he said, now here's the blessing that comes out of the curse. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Translation is okay, but the interpretational question is, what's the subject of those verbs, and what's the antecedent of those pronouns? And I think we sometimes miss it. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, one of the sons of Noah, the Semites, come from Shem. Canaan shall be his servant. Okay. Yeah, we just thought saw that. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Now the question is, who's the he? Who's the he that's dwelling in the tents of Shem? A lot of interpreters say, well, it's, it's Japheth that's going to dwell in the tents of Shem. I don't want to get into all a bunch of Hebrew grammar, which was not quite true. I love Hebrew grammar. <laughs> but it would be common if I have two clauses like this, that the subject of the one is the subject of the next. So can I just be a bit more pedantic in the translation? God shall enlarge Jacob. There's blessing for Jacob. And God shall dwell in tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant, who's the his? God. And Canaan will be God's servant. Beautiful. Beautiful. The blessing here, God will dwell in the tents of Shem. Did you ever read the first chapter of John? <clears throat> and John is discussing there the Incarnation. Discussing the incarnation. And what's the imagery that John uses? God will tabernacle. He'll dwell. He'll dwell in flesh. And we read John chapter 1 and we see that as a beautiful expression of the incarnation. God dwelling. <coughs> I submit to you that if we can figure that out from John, we ought to be able to figure that out from, from Genesis. No difference. God will dwell in the tents of Shem. I submit to you that in that statement, we have a prophecy of the incarnation. A prophecy of the incarnation. God will dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan will be his, that is God's servant. Here's the, one of the things that we're going to be seeing here in these covenant installments. All is universal. I'll make this statement to you. That the promise of Christ in the Old Testament was never, ever <coughs> uniquely a Jewish promise. It was never uniquely a Jewish promise. The Jews, Israel, the physical line, yes. But the promise of Messiah was always universal. There were no Jews in Genesis 3.15. Right? Humanity. Humanity. The curse reverser for humanity. And then, now here. Here's all of humanity. All, all that 
there was a humanity was Noah and his kids. Follow me there. Promise given. They weren't Jews. You know, you know that they were Jews. Uh, Shem became ancestor of Abraham, but Abraham wasn't a Jew. I was teaching kind of a night class one time, open to the public, and I made the statement, you know, that Abraham wasn't a Jew. And this elder lady came to me and says, Abraham was a Jew. I said, no, he wasn't. He says, yes, he was. I just started to argue with the old ladies. <laughs> just let him go. Just let him go. But he wasn't, all right? He wasn't. Uh, there's no, no Jews yet. The, the promise of Messiah was always universal. It was always universal. And so here it is. Even Canaan, that, even Canaan that was under the curse is now the recipient of the blessing of God. How amazing is this? So the very, this, here's the second. Can we see the progression? Let's go. In, in the first promise, in the first promise of the gospel, we know that the curse reverser is going to be a man. In the second promise, We learn that he's a God man. The God man. The second messianic statement. God will dwell in the tents of Shem. That's the incarnation. It's the incarnation. Second promise. I know that the Redeemer, the cursed reverse man, God man. And there's 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 a catechism. Right? There's the catechism. Question, my favorite question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Who's the Redeemer of God's elect? The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures in one person forever. There it is. God. Man. In one person. Not a contradiction. But now as this the, the, the new the new part of revelation we learned that he's God man yeah so the Noachian covenant Noachian covenant now the next the next promise is with Abraham what time will be done pardon me <laughs> <laughs> I don't know we you tell me what time we're done. I don't see anybody snoozing yet, so keep going. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll go until you leave. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to hurry. But this, I'm telling you what, this is good stuff. After the no waking cover, trouble again. Here comes sin. Here comes sin. We have Genesis chapter 10 called the Table of Nations, have all these nations now. But even that, even that Table of Nations, that's one of those things you read in the Old Testament, oh, how come i got to read this? That Table of Nations is an evidence that God is keeping his promise in the preservation of humanity. Right? Humanity continues. But in that continuation of humanity into which the Messiah, the first reverse is going to come, sin is just growing. And there's chapter 11, and you have, you have Babel. You have Babel. And God comes down again in judgment in Babel, and he scatters the nations. He scatters the nations in judgment, but also in mercy. Read Acts in mercy as well. Raises the question. I learned that the Messiah, that the curse reverser, was going to come into the line of ship. But now... The nations are scattered. We had the table of nations in chapter 10. And now Babel, things are scattered. Where, where's, where's Shem? Where's Shem? Wonderfully. After Babel, God gives us the genealogy of Shem. I know where Shem is, God says. The promise is intact. I'm not losing. And so we have the genealogy of Shem. Father the Sima. The close of chapter 11, and we're introduced to Abraham. Introduced to Abraham. And now God is going to enter into a covenant 
with Abraham. Covenant of grace. I know it's grace because Abraham was a pagan. Abraham was an Ur. You read Joshua chapter 24. And you'll find there that Abraham was an idolater. I think you sometimes get the idea that Abraham was a lone suffering saint there in Ur of the Chaldees. No, he wasn't. He was an idolater as guilty and as filthy as anybody else in Ur. Here comes grace. And God called him. And God saved him. Yeah. And God enters into a covenant now with Abraham. And Promises Abraham a seed. Here's the seed again. I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make you a universal blessing. That all the families of the earth are going to be blessed in Abraham. Universal again, you see it? Universal. But what is the advancement now? We, we, we know... We knew from Genesis that even, maybe I ought to add this idea, that that man is going to be a sinner. Right? That man is going to be, God would go on the prince of Shem. He be a sinner. Abraham was of the line of Shem, so that part is going to be continued on. That part is a preservation of what was already revealed. But a seed now that is going to come into Abraham. And a land, I wish I could talk about the land that's got its own set of theology. Universal blessing, but the messianic idea can be focused in this coming seed of Abraham. Sometimes used collectively, seeds, sometimes used. Singularly of Christ. If you look at the, 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 read John chapter 8 again, as the Lord is dealing with the Pharisees and he kind of interprets this for us. Now, Paul, I'm sorry, Paul, Paul in, in Galatians 3, I think, I'm sorry, Galatians 3, Paul talks about this in, in regard to the seed. Paul says the seed, singular, is Christ. But we have a New Testament verification here. The seed, singular, is Christ. But at the same time, believers are the seed of Abraham, spiritual. So you have a spiritual seed, all believers, and you have that physical seed that is that is Christ. Seed is going to come, and it's going to be a universal blessing, a universal blessing. And that I, I got to be brief here. I'm sorry, because uh, I think I, I saw you're supposed to be out of here in five minutes. That, 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 that seed, that seed of Christ was repeated to Isaac, same covenant, was repeated to Jacob, same covenant, it was given to Abraham. But we have a new wrinkle indeed. Not only are we going to see that Abraham is a Semite man, so we're, we're not, not violating anything that's already been revealed. But an interesting statement in Genesis chapter 20, 49, verse 10, there, as Jacob is on his deathbed, and he's giving his last will and testament to his kids. And he comes to Judah. And he says to Judah that the scepter or kingship will not depart from Judah until. King James says Shiloh until Shiloh comes. Scepter kingship will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Word Shiloh is not really a proper name. If I were to translate Shiloh, I would translate it like this. The scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it really belongs. To whom it belongs. To whom that kingship belongs. So now, Here's the advancement. By the time, by the time I come, by the time I come to the end of Genesis, 
I know that the curse reverser is going to be man. He's going to be God man. He's going to be a Semitic man of the tribe of Judah. Going to come into Judah. So we're narrowing it down. Another detail. Another detail is being given to us. Much more I can say. Much more I want to say about the Abrahamic covenant. But can you see that that seed is Jesus, right? Development of a new. Next is Saul. You would think, you would think that having read Genesis 49 10, that the very next chapter would be given the kingship of Jew. But it's hundreds of years. It's hundreds of years. We would date Jacob there. What do we date Jacob? Jacob this time about 18, about 1876 or so BC. David doesn't come on the scene until 1000 BC. So 800 years. There's 800 years now between the Abrahamic covenant and what we are going to know as the Davidic covenant. In 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm not going to open my Bible to it. 2 Samuel chapter 7. David, remember, wants to build a house for the Lord. God says, no, I'm going to build you a house. David met a, a literal house. God met a dynasty. And God comes to David and makes an unconditional promise to David that the kingship is not going to leave your house. I'm going to establish your son, your seed, seed, seed. I'm going to establish your seed unconditionally. Unconditionally. Then I have a throne that's going to be forever. A throne that is going to be universal. We know now, here's the, here's the advancement. Not only is the Redeemer going to come into humanity, be the God man, a Semitic God man of the tribe of Judah, but now we know the very family. By the time we come to the Davidic covenant, we know the very family of the tribe of Judah into which Messiah is going to come. Unconditionally. Not like Saul. And you look, at, you look at the sons of David. You look at David himself. David committed sins and his sons committed sins that were far greater than Saul committed. I mean, Saul was kicked out of kingship for not obeying completely. And here's David, a murderer, or adulterer, and here's his kids who were right out. But God said, no, I'll chastise him, but not take away the promise. The promise was unconditional because the promise was Jesus. And Jesus was going to come. There had to be a David. There had to be a Christ. I come to that Davidic covenant. And here comes Jesus. So I'm not surprised that when I open up my New Testament. When I open up my New Testament. It picks up where the Old Testament left off. The last book of the Old Testament. In the Hebrew order is Chronicles. Yeah. And Chronicles had all those genealogies. Chronicles was written after the exile, where the people were scattered. And the natural question, the natural question was, where's, where, where's the line of David? Where's the line of David? So you have all these genealogies that you get so bored with. See? All these genealogies that oh, you run through, but what a theological message on those genealogies. In those genealogies, God is saying, here's where David is. Here's where David's line is. And it's not without significance, is it? I read those genealogies in Chronicles, the last book of the Old Testament. I turn the page to Matthew, and lo and behold, it starts out. Genealogies, right? Genealogies taking us right back. Taking us right back to Abraham. Taking us right back to Adam. Luke takes us right back to Adam. Or, or, or to uh, Abraham, Luke takes us right back to Adam. Those genealogies are, are theologically rich. They are demonstrating that God's covenant promise concerning the coming of the first reverse is right on track. Is right on track. Old Testament narrowed down more and more details. And every wicked king became a prince of twins. When is the ideal king going to come? 
What is he going to come? It increases the anticipation, the Psalms, and increases the anticipation. When is he going to come? When is he going to come? But he was coming. He was coming. And in that covenant manifestation, those covenant revelations, he looked at that seed, and Jesus is there. He's there. I better quit. <laughs>